Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's show is brought to you by Herman Marshall Whiskey, Dallas County's first distillery of handcrafted award-winning small batch whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels in the great state of Texas. Built from the grain up, just like good whiskey and better friends should be. They have a bourbon, a rye, and a blend, and they are also building a brand new facility that should be opening sometime this spring, so you guys get a chance to check it out. Please do so, because this is some good stuff, especially this time of year with the cold weather. Nothing better than a little bit of warm whiskey. And welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest was a guy that I watched growing up a little bit playing. Um, He was... When I, my career started, he was he was coming out of baseball, but he's uh, written a book telling a pretty good story, and uh, he's from a baseball hotbed as well, the middle of Nebraska. Mr. <laughs> Kip, Mr. Kip Gross. Kip, how are you, sir? I'm doing good. I'm just waking out of bed, but we're doing fine. All right. Wait, we're older people. We don't get to sleep in anymore, do we? Well, I kind of had to this morning, so uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Not little kids or anything else. I didn't want to, didn't mean to wake you up. No, no, no. We're good. Doing all that. So you're out in Arizona these days. Yeah. Right? Are you coaching? What are you, what are you doing? No, you know what? I, I just give lessons once in a while. You know, I, 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 uh, I really enjoy doing that. And I, I coached, you know, when my kids were eight all the way through my son uh, and my daughter through high school. And, uh, and then I uh, just kind of gave it up. I gave it up. I moved over here. And so I just been giving lessons a little bit here and there. And that's about it. Playing a lot of golf then, I take it? You know what? I haven't played a lot of golf. I really haven't. Uh, I used to play every stinking day. I mean, maybe 36 holes a day, but it, it just it started consuming my life. And so I got away from it. It was It's all I did. I woke up I'm like, let's go to the range. Let's go play golf. And I so I just said, I got to quit doing this. So okay. yeah, you get to the point where you're, you get good. Yep. And then and then it's like, you know, it's like baseball. You know, you want to get better and better. Well, I I you know, I got to a one handicap at one time and it, it just, it wasn't, it wasn't fun anymore. So it became a job. That's usually, you know, pitchers are supposed to be good at golf, right? I think that's part of their MO. You know, they get a chance, <laughs> they take their clubs on trips and, and everything right. else. The position guys we play, I think spring training and then when the season's over with. So we're, we've got to catch up to you guys to, uh, w- with all that. So, um, you know, I was, I was reading a little bit, just going through a little bit of background on you. Did you really not play high school baseball at all? We didn't have baseball in, in, in Western Nebraska for high school at all. We just played Legion ball, uh, probably 30 games in the summer. And that was it. Was and, uh, yeah, there was, I didn't play high school sport. Oh, really? No, no. What? I just, uh, I, w- I walked on at Nebraska. What, uh, what town in Nebraska are you from? Gearing, Nebraska. It's, it's, they call it the twin city, Scotts Bluff and Gearing, Nebraska. It's, uh, it's actually on the national map because there's nothing else out there. So they, they actually have it put on the map just because of, uh, they got to put something out there. Yeah. I played with a guy from Elwood, Nebraska. Yeah. There's a lot of small towns out there. Well, they're not called towns though, right? They're called something else, aren't they? Well, you know, you can call them a village if you want. That's what it was. Yeah. Of a town is if you have a post office, that's, that's when you become a town and there's Melbita was right down the road from where I lived. Uh, my uncle, actually my mom's uncle lived there and, uh, it was, you didn't even need a permit or anything to build a house. You just do your thing. It was a, it was a village. So, so growing up, you didn't know baseball. You didn't play anything really. Not even, I mean, what's, what's Nebraska youth. I think football, right? If I go back to Tom Osborne and Nebraska Cornhuskers for college football. <laughs> that wasn't you either. You weren't a football guy or anything. You know what? It, it's, it's, that's part of the book. The whole thing that I'm doing right now is just how I grew up and, and how things went. And the reason I didn't play football per se was, uh, there's a couple of reasons. One, I needed to make money because uh, my dad was not going to give me anything. I had to work for everything I had. And uh, the other reason was uh, our, our football program was just terrible. Uh, our ninth grade class uh, was undefeated for like six or seven straight years. But the football team was just, ter- the, you know, the high school football team was just no good. It, it never was good. And I always blamed it on the coaching. And so I, you know, they wanted me to come out and be the quarterback. And it, it actually hurt me through academics and everything because so many of the teachers just didn't like me because of me not playing sports. Wow. And, and 
So, I mean, I actually got in a confrontation with the head football coach one time. Uh, he, he, we kind of met at a, at the, uh, w- the wood shop building and, uh, he, I was up there all by myself and obviously you're probably not supposed to be by yourself, but at th- that day and age, you know, should I clean my guns at the, at the, at the wood shop and clean my pheasants and ducks there? And, uh, we got into it. We got to a little altercation and he, he threatened to take me to the office. I said, let's go. You know, what, what are you going to do? But it was all about the football. That's all it was. That's why, that's why I always had confrontations with, with the, the administration and the teachers back then. So, yeah. And you had, you had siblings, right? How many, how many brothers? I have two older brothers. Uh, my one brother lives in Longmont. Well, not in Longmont. He's in that area now, Longmont, Colorado. He's been in Colorado for pretty much his whole life. And then I have an older brother that still is where I grew up uh, in in Gearing and Scotts Bluff. He's uh, he's uh, been there his whole life too, basically. Yeah, I had two brothers that were older than me as well. That you know, ten and fourteen years older, and always wanted to be better than my brothers, right? I was, but you know, they played football and basketball. I played hockey and, and soccer, but baseball always tended to seem to be the thing that kind of brought us together, right? I think oh, yeah. that helped me in my career because they would throw you know your older brothers aren't aren't cutting you any slack right they're doing everything they can to you you know beating on you you know throwing everything <laughs> at it is that is that the same kind of thing you you dealt with growing up with them yeah yeah i used to i was very very competitive from it from just being a young kid i mean i remember i would beat up my brothers both of them <laughs> and i was always a younger kid younger one but i was always bigger than they were and so you know i, I remember the one time i had them both down on the ground and i'm and i'm just boom 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 slapping them around and uh i mean we got along really well it wasn't that problem it was just it was just i was very competitive and and you know i, I just baseball i just had this this arm you know and I, I could throw and i could i could i was big and i always loved lifting and uh it's just one of those things you know but yeah you're very competitive out, out in the streets playing 500 uh you're you know we were always outside oh my god i mean we we never went in the house you know if we went in the house it's because mom said hey you got to have dinner now it's five o'clock and other than that, you know, and then we'd go back out and we'd, we'd go play basketball at, at the neighbors because he had lights on his court, you know, in his driveway. So it was, that's all we did was play sports. And you were the with a baseball guy out of – did your brothers play sports as well or was it just I – mean, Yeah, uh, my my brother that's in Colorado, he wasn't very athletic. He, he, did, he did play, though, all the way through. Uh, my oldest brother, he got – you know, both my brothers, my dad got in a wreck uh, – bad, bad wreck. So my oldest brother had been in a wheelchair since he was 16 or 17. Uh, he was a shortstop in, in our hometown. And, uh, but that was the end of the, the, the line for him for doing that. But, uh, yeah, it was it just sports everywhere. It's all we did. And, uh, that's, that's, you're right though. I think it's as looking up at my brothers, I will, you know, you wanted to be better than them. You know, that was, my, that was my motivation, right? That's what we wanted to do. Um, you know, you talk about, you know, giving some lessons here and there and watching the game and, these kids, nobody seems to be motivated like we were anymore, right? They don't, you know, if even if like if you're giving me a pitching lesson and I know you played at the highest level, I want to. What do I need to do to be better than you? You know, when you're doing lessons and, and being around kids, do you, are you noticing that? It's because of the generation era when you play is a lot different than now. Well, it's funny you say that because I've actually in some of my lessons, I've actually kicked, kicked kids out of the cage. <laughs> I have. I said, you know what? We're getting nothing out of this today. I mean, you're just, you're not even trying. And so I, I've, I've literally kicked kids. Hey, mom, come on over, grab your kid and go. I'll, I'll call you when you can come back someday. And uh, because it, it's, I mean, what's the point really? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do everything I can to help you. And, and I'm, a, I'm the kind of guy where I give my, my hundredth lesson with the kids just as I'm just as enthusiastic as I am the first one. That's just who I am. And, but sometimes these kids come around and like you're saying, it's just, it's what, what's going on today. Do you want it? Do you want to be here or not? And so, yeah, I've, I've actually thrown kids out of the cage. And but, it, the parents but, yeah, actually you're say right, something to you. You're right. The, the motivational factor is sometimes it's just, it's just not, it's not there. You know, it's like, you know, the, the computer games and, and everything else going on and the outside, you know, social media now it's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I coached high school baseball for five years. That was, I, that was eye opening big time. Oh, really? The, uh, yeah. that's, that's do the parents respect you for that, for doing that? Because it's, you know, you know, you always hear that the old, the old adage, they'll listen to me, but they won't listen to you. And yet you're reiterating the same thing. Do the parents, when you do that, are they actually kind of high fiving you saying thank you? Or are they just more pissed off at you because their kid knows more than you? 
Well, the, the, the ones I've thrown out of the cage, they were happy I did it because they knew their kid needed a, a little little uh, lesson. But the high school, all, all the years I coached baseball, I had my number one rule, parents, I'm off, I'm off limits. We're not talking. We will not talk during the entire season. We're going to have our first practice, and you have to be there. One of you have got, have got to be there. After that, you, you're not even allowed at the practices. I, I didn't allow any of them at the practices because it was – it was basically having another coach in the stands, you know, Hey Johnny, Hey Johnny, do this. Hey Johnny, but no, 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 no. I, I'm your coach. I'm going to coach your kid. Go get your groceries for an hour and a half and come back. And, and you know what, at, when I first started doing it that way, I had some, some, uh, some parents that weren't happy about it, but over the years, I actually had parents now call and saying, Hey, can I get my kid on your team? Because they, they really enjoyed it. And, they, and, and you know, you know, when, when you're out on a baseball field, and you know, mom and dad, or somebody's in the stands watching you. You're always looking over your shoulder at mom and dad, you know, because you want to please them and whatever. And I, I said, you're not it's just you're, you're not giving 100 percent out here. So, you know, let's let's have a nice short practice. My practices never lasted over 90 minutes. Never. I don't care what level I was at. They never did. Let's get it in. Let's get it done and get out of here. And uh, it, it worked out really, really well. But but yeah, the, the, the parents. What you're talking about is. Uh, I've, I've told this many, many times to so many people is I don't need to talk to a parent to know who the parents are. All I need to do is talk to the kids. And that's what, you know, over the course of a season, you know, you sit out in the outfield with Johnny or whoever his name is, and you just sit and talk to these kids once in a while. Next thing you know, you learn about the parents. You learn about their families really fast. And I don't think that would happen otherwise uh, if you just talk to the parents because the parents aren't going to tell you who they are. But sooner or later, those kids do tell you, and it, it's 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 pretty enlightening. To be honest with you, what you what you learn about uh, uh, kids' families. Yeah, and, and I think the kids tend to respect coaches more when when because kids are smart, right? They can see the forest of the trees. When you actually take that time just to sit there and have a conversation, to generally care enough to I'm just not here as your coach, but I'm here as kind of as a as a friend, right? Because of right. what you, what you learn from you know from your childhood all the way up to playing in the big leagues. And, and teaching that. So, you know, these kids, when you actually sit there and right, they, they, are they more inclined to open up to you and kind of ask more questions or is it just kind of just standing there listening to them talk? It it's yeah. Yeah. It's when you first start out with some of these kids, cause they don't say a word, you know, some of them will just not say anything. And then, so you just kind of go back out again the next week and, and uh, you sit out there and say, you know, you got any brothers or sisters and, you know, and then they start opening up to you. And it, it really is crazy what you can learn about what goes on inside of a house. And, you know, some of them are just dying to tell you, but they don't want to. And that was my story growing up was, you know, I, I, I didn't want to tell anybody who my dad was, really was. And that's a big, big, huge part of the book that I'm writing is, is because I, I was that kid that was always looking over my shoulder, you know, when I was at the baseball field with, uh, with, you know, practicing and, and, I hated it because it's like, God, what's he doing? What's he doing? Is he going to yell at me? Is he going to, what is, you know, am I going to get in the truck after the practice and get my ass kicked? I mean, you know, I just didn't know. And so that's why I did it. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of respect out of it and they, I respected them a lot too, because they allowed me to, to coach their kids that way. And you think about it as a lot of those kids, you talk about how, you know, I've, you know, I've coached the same thing. Those kids that are always, every time they step in a box, they look just to see who they're pleasing but for you to be able to, you know, move past that, because right, you've, I'm sure you've seen kids that have done that, and then all of a sudden they just they've had enough of baseball, right? And, but for you to continue, you know, to be able to help that story that you tell, and I'm sure you know, if you say, hey, I, you know, they're came up to me, I, my dad's always telling me this and that, and I, and do you have that conversation with them and explain it to them that you you can move beyond this? Well, yeah, and that that's that's the whole point, and that's you know, baseball is is such a great sport because you fail so much and that's one of the greatest parts about baseball to me is because when you fail so much you gotta you gotta learn how to figure it out and make these adjustments uh to to play the next pitch or the next inning or the next game or the next year whatever and that's that's how life is you know it, you're, you're gonna fail constantly in life growing up and if you don't i feel sorry for you because if you never fail, you're not going to get very far or you're not, you're actually not taking many chances in life. And so, uh, yeah, the, the baseball thing, 
with the parents and the kids, it it's it's enlightening when when you really get into some of these kids and what you do. And and you know what's really cool about what, what we're talking about right now is I've now gotten since I've moved to Arizona, I've gotten so many, I shouldn't say so many, I've got quite a few though, uh, texts or emails from parents and kids that I that I coached. And, you know, now they signed a letter of intent or they're they're going to college or or whatever. And it, it's it's crazy how you actually impact somebody's life. And these you know, are- coach, and I got I got one right now. He, he was uh, he, he was a couple of years ago. He was like, uh, what do they call it on the Internet? He went he went viral. Uh, you know, he, he played college ball out of high school. And uh, then he, he got he signed with the uh, uh, Washington Nationals and that that he went to the dad's office where he was a, a mechanic and he gave him the hat and it, 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 it went viral. Now he's doing he's doing he, he got released, but now he's doing these these lessons on YouTube and, and TikTok or whatever they all call this stuff. And every once in a while he mentions my name. And it's 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 really crazy that that these kids you did you, you had an impact in their life, you know, and and. And as you're doing it, you really don't realize that. No, and that's the beauty of it. Like you said, it's the the effect we have might not be now. You know, it's ten years down the road, but for him to remember that, that means you made an impression on him, regardless of what it was to do it. And I think that's a lot of this generation is all about the me stuff, right? It's not you know a lot of these kids like you said they come to you and I know more than you, coach. You know, you're here, you're here for me. I'm not here for you. Do you? Did you run into that as when you were coaching of, of that? And how do you deal with that as a coach? Because, you know, these are long seasons, especially in high school, right? Puberty, you know, puberty and, uh, and all this stuff that they're dealing with, emotions and everything else. How do you, how'd you deal with all that? You know what? It, it's the whole, what you're talking about is so funny because it, it's so true. There, there, there are kids that just, they think they know everything. And, you know, I, I'll go back to the same story I always had when, it, you know, when I, when I played Legion baseball my last season, by the way, that's the only stats I remember in my entire career or my last year at Legion ball. I can't tell you my, any minor league. I can't tell you any big league. I can't tell you any of my stats in Japan. I, I don't know any. I had a guy that they asked me what my war was. <laughs> <laughs> I said, dude, I can't even tell you a stat that I played in, in, since, since I was at Legion baseball. And so I, I just lost my train of thought a little bit there. But but the the whole thing with these kids, they think they know everything. And what I tell them is, you know, you know, guys, when I played Legion ball, I had, I had Nintendo stats. Well, Nintendo now it's Xbox, whatever. But I said, my numbers were, were crazy. And I thought I knew everything when I walked out the university of Nebraska. And then I got to the university of Nebraska and I found out really quick. I didn't know anything. And then, you know, I got drafted, uh, after three years of playing ball and I got to minor league baseball and I thought I knew everything because I just came out of college. And then my first year of minor league ball, I didn't know anything. And as I moved up the ladder, it just oh, repeated and repeated and repeated. And that's why I always tell these, these, you know, these people that played even uh, college baseball, you don't know much about the game of baseball. You don't. And I was a student of the game. I mean, I asked, talked to everybody. Uh, I wore, I wore players out in the dugout and on the, on the practice field were out there. I'm just, I just, I wanted to learn everything it was to know about the game. And I found out I didn't know, I didn't know anything. I really didn't. So yeah, these kids, you know, because they throw harder than they get kid next to them and they maybe got an out or struck out some more than the other guy. They, they think they're so good and they're not. And so, you know, the, the game of baseball is really humbling when you when you start moving up the ladder. Yeah, you're right, because you're a big fish in a small pond, right? You're, you're Nebraska and then you get to now you're a small fish in a big pond and it, it's ever evolving. And that's that's the beauty of it. The kids that really want to learn. Or like you talked about, they, they asked the questions to you guys. Hey, right. what was it like? You know, what were you feeling? You know, how, you know, what riding buses, you know, how did, you know, getting into, you know, you getting to the big leagues, was it 1990 was your first year to get to the big yeah. leagues and the guys that were around you, the, the, some of the names that were on that, that Reds team pitching wise, can you go through some of those guys and you know what you learned from them? Well, it, you know what, a lot of the pitching that I learned uh, was basically when I was kind of with the Mets because I had I had some really good pitching coaches coming up, uh, Greg Pavlik, Joel Horlin. Uh, uh, I mean, they, I just I the Mets at that time, if you remember, in the '86 era, right there, that's when that's when the pitching and, and the Mets were supposed to have this dynasty, and so they had a lot of really good instructors. Now, when I got with the Reds, you're talking about the pitchers. Believe it or not, when I got with the Reds, I sat and talked to most of the hitters at that time because I wanted to learn from the hitters you know, how to get hitters out. 
And so like Ken Griffey senior, he got so tired of me sitting next to him. <laughs> and I wore him out. He'd, he'd get up once. I'll say, Hey kids, stay right here. Stay right here. I'm going to go to the other side of the dugout. And I'm going to watch the rest of the game. <laughs> and I mean, it happened a lot because I, I just, I, I wanted to learn, you know, and I learned a lot about his son at the time too, because, because he was just drafted number one in the, in the country. And, and so that was interesting to hear about his story uh about getting signed and the money they gave him which was a complete joke what they what just a quick story about junior his what he actually signed for wasn't what he signed for is what what you, the media was it was a lot lot more but they didn't want to put it out because they knew this the signing bonus would raise for everybody and so they kept it hush hush how much he really got uh but senior obviously played 22 years in the big leagues uh he was just a, a, a great guy to live here because it's the, the guys he played against, I mean, were 22 years ago. And so it was just, just kind of do the math on some of the, the players he played against. I mean, I played against Fred Lynn. I mean, I, I'm, I'm in San Diego we're, and Fred Lynn's in right field. And I'm like, Holy shit. You know, what? we got Fred Lynn out in right field right now. And so, so, you know, you, my always, my always biggest thing as far as baseball, and I don't, I'm getting off the subject a little bit, but, uh, I've always, you know, people always say, if you could have dinner, if you could have a conversation with one person, who would it be? Mine would be the easiest one on the planet would be Babe Ruth. And, you know, it just, God, I, I just wish I could have watched that man play one time live and just, and just to see, you know, how, how they, they went about their business back then. Cause you know, every generation thinks they're better than the new generation coming up and, 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 you know, it's so going back with like Babe Ruth and, you know, Lou Gehrig and some of these guys back when I, I just think it would be so cool just to spend one day with one of these guys and just see what their life really is. Cause it's not even close to what we do today. You know, we got cars, you know, we got houses and we don't work in the winters and, and these guys had to, they had to bust their ass constantly just, just to play baseball for the year. Yeah. And I've heard, uh, John Rocker told me about this, about that his, he learned more from a hitting guy. Uh, than he did from from the pitchers because you know, but you talk about that's being a student of the game, wanting to learn what a hitter's thinking against facing me, right? What's it like? And then, and I'm sure, you know, you find guys that that were kind of like you that pitched like you, and and you, you know, I'm sure you pick their brains and everything else. But I, I'm sure you probably don't see that nowadays of a hitter actually going and sitting in there with pitchers. Some guys go in, they would go into pitchers meetings and just listen, right? And do that right. and learn because they wanted to make themselves better. You watched the game, and, but you asked too. Now it just seems like, all right, let me go and look at my iPad, what I did, this and that. And, and there's no almost involvement in the game to, 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 to better themselves other than let me just watch, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's, you know, if, if you ever watched me coach or sit in the dugout during the practice, uh, one of the biggest things that I always told the kids was, you've got to ask questions. And I, all the kids I give lessons to, too, I tell their parents the same way. I said, you got to get your kid to ask me questions because it's going to save you a lot of money in the, in the long run because the, the more questions they ask, the better they get a lot quicker. And a lot of people don't understand that. But, but if you don't, I, I, I can't read your mind. And so if, if you got a question, you got something in your head that, that's going on, let's find it out now because, because, that's going to set you free a little bit as far as what we can teach you now so you can advance because it's, it's on your mind. You don't want to ask you think it's a dumb question and it's not a dumb question. You know, it might be a dumb question to you, but to me, it might be the most relevant question you're going to have in your entire career of playing baseball. And so let's get it out there and let's find out. And, you know, all the kids that, that asked the questions for me playing ball, they, they always got better a lot faster. And I always encourage them to do that, do ask, but I'll tell you, most of them don't, they just don't, you know, they go out and they go to do their thing and, and they get off the field and they don't ever get much better either. So, yeah, I got a great story about asking questions, by the way. That, well, they, you know, that's the thing. It's, I think this generation is they're afraid to ask. They're so busy being told, right. And you talk about with your lessons because that the only way to understand anything is to, is for yourself to your, understand your body and everything else. What, you know, how does that feel? But you're right. The, so you think the kids that actually ask the questions are the ones that advance faster and further than the kids that, that don't? hundred percent. They do. There's no, no question in my mind. They do. And that's why I say, you know, if you ask questions, what's on your mind, you're going to learn a lot faster, everything, because it's something that you want to learn. 
But if you don't know, then you're never going to know by not asking that question. I had a, I had a kid in my high school. I had, I coached him for four straight years. Uh, he was from Korea. And I called him Larry. That was his nickname, Larry. Actually, the teacher started calling him Larry. <laughs> Everything at the school is kind of funny. But anyway, this kid, he was he was god-awful at baseball. I mean, god-awful. He never never had a glove when he came out. Didn't have anything. Didn't know how to throw a baseball, nothing. My I never cut a kid ever, by the way, on any team ever. I just never believed in it because, you know, you only have so many years to play the game, especially through high school. I mean, how many guys go on to play college baseball? And so I never cut a kid. I said, if I if we can get you a uniform, you can sit in the dugout and you can keep score, do whatever. So this kid, Larry, comes out. And uh, that's his nickname for me anyway. Anyway, so so the kid would just ask questions constantly. I mean, nonstop ask questions. And over the four years – you know, he went from day one, probably throwing a baseball 25 feet to in four years, he was now throwing it probably, you know, 200, 200, 200 feet. And, you know, he, 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 he didn't, he didn't want to play much. He very rarely wanted to play. I said, Hey, let Larry get, get, get a bat, go hit. You know, I, said, I don't want to play today, coach. I don't want to They call me Kip. I never had him call me coach. You know, he's one of person with me, but, uh, over those four years, he never stopped asking questions. He got better and better and better. And the funny thing is, guess what he does today? He's a coach in Korea of baseball. Wow. Yeah, it, it, it actually makes me tear up a little bit because he he's doing something that he loved to do. But had if he was at any other school on the planet, he wouldn't have been on a team. I mean, you have you have no idea how god awful this kid was. I mean, they would have said, no, Larry, you can't play. You know, you're no good. You're just taking up space. And I, I kept this kid around. He was great for the team. He was funny. You know, he'd bring his little iPad in and, and he'd put videos on once in a while. And it, he was, he was, he was, he was, you know, part of the character of the team. And we ended up winning a championship in, in Cal Southern California in, in my third year with him. And uh, so he got a ring, he got the whole gig. So it's, it, 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 it's just one of those things where ask those questions and see where it goes. And he, he's one of my biggest highlights in my entire coaching career because of what he's doing today. Yep, because it seems like that was the philosophy you had. You know, you talked about talking with, with uh, Griffey Senior of doing that, where to the point where, yeah, it, it's annoying, but you understand though too. You were that guy, right? You were the guy asking all the questions, and where it got you to this point today. And now, like you said, you look, and now he's over there coaching, able to, you know, at, you know, uh, translate and and to pass along what what you taught him. Right now, now all of a sudden, Kip Gross's reach is just beyond Arizona and California. Now you're over in uh, the KBO, right? right? How far you reach it. Who does, you didn't think about that, right? When you were, you were playing, Oh, I'm going to have, I'll be able to coach a guy and he's going to be doing this. Right. I mean, it's, it, you're right. As a coach that, how good does that make you feel knowing that all he did, all he did was ask questions, you know? And then I'm, so do you tell your, your, your boys about, about, Hey, I think a lot of it is these kids are afraid to make a mistake, right? You notice that? Smart. Even in questions, wow! Like you talked about dumb questions. No, there's no, there's no dumb questions. It's just it, it's dumb to not ask, right? Because that's the only way to get better. Exactly, exactly. And you're you're right about that. It, it's it's they're they're afraid to ask. I think, and you know, I was afraid to fail. I wasn't afraid to ask a question. I was afraid to fail, and and that's why I think I got as good as I got because I refused to fail. I was gonna I was gonna screw it up. Believe me, I was gonna screw it up a lot. But I was going to figure out how to make that adjustment to, to you know, to succeed the next time out with it because you're going to make so many mistakes in the game of baseball. And, you know, over time, those those mistakes compound to the point where you have to get better. Or you're finished. You're done. I mean, it's your, your pink slip's going to be in your locker next, next thing you know because the, you're just not getting any better. And so I was afraid to fail. And so that's why I worked my ass off a little bit better more than everybody else in that clubhouse because I, I was not going to, if I was going to fail, if I was going to get released, it was going to be because I wasn't good enough anymore. And it wasn't going to be because I didn't work hard and ask the questions and find out how to get better. And it, it's, it's kind of funny because, you know, my last three years of baseball, I wasn't very good. <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> And, but they kept calling to come back and play, you know, here, here, sign this contract, come back and play another year. And I didn't get released until my 16th year of base baseball. And I got released twice that same year. And believe it or not, I still had teams calling that winter after, after I got released and saying, Hey, we want to sign you another deal. 
And I said, guys, are you, are you, are you watching what I'm watching? <laughs> I swear I did. I was like, are you really watching? I mean, I'm not good. I stink. They were going it's off your like war, apparently. That. <laughs> they, they were going off your war, apparently. Your war. Yeah, that number's there high. You go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was just honest with everybody, too. You know, I, I was, you know, I was married for 23 years. You know, my wife passed away a little over five years ago. But, you know, she always told me, she said, Kip, you're just way too honest with people. And I said, I, I know. I just maybe get a little too much information once in a while. I don't know what I do, but it's it's just something I grew up with and I, I, I didn't ever want to deceive people. And so the honesty thing and, and telling these clubs, you know, I'm not good. You know, you can, you can try to pay me again, but I'm just not good anymore. And I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I, I like it because I think a lot of people now, nobody wants to be honest. Everybody wants to sugarcoat it. Hey, you know, we're going to go this way. Just be honest and tell me the truth that I suck. But if you want me to come back, that's fine. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. <laughs> I have that reputation big time of being just a uh, little, little, little too forth going with everything in here. Here it is. But that's and, the problem. And, and no. Internet. I, I, I'm not, I can't write. And so what I say <laughs> is real bad. It's horrible. You know, and they're like, Oh, why are you mad? I'm not mad at all. I'm just having fun here. You know, I'm, I, I laugh so much, so much when I'm on the internet, it's, it's crazy. And, and so many people think you're, you're, you're because you're direct, I guess you'd say, and I don't know how to write it. It's, you know, they, they all think you're, you're mad at them or whatever. Like, why would, I don't even know who you are. Why are you mad at you? Yeah. You hurt my feelings by you type something or said something. Well, I didn't, <laughs> no, I'm just trying to be honest. And I, I think that's just gone by the wayside. So, you, yeah. you, you know, you talk about, you know, honesty and, and, and then also being afraid of failure. Was that, you know, you, I just listened to an interview you talked about, you know, the influence your mom had on you is what she did. I mean, my, mine was, you know, the same way, both you know, parents were able to, you know, he said, be there and do that. And I, you know, you talk about your story a little bit, um, but what your mom meant to you more than, you know, you know, you talk about your mom on this positive side and then your dad on this, on this negative side uh, to you know, talk about that a little bit and how, you know, the influence that she had and how that progressed your career from, you know, where you went from and, and, but understanding you talk about every year it was evolving again. Wait, I'm just a little fish again. Yeah, uh, I might have a little tough time talking about this, but yeah, my mom was, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I can't tell you. I don't know where I'd be today without her. I really don't, because just on, like you said, on the other side, my dad, uh, she was just, she was just the perfect person. She, she did no wrong. She, she was a saint. I mean, you talk to anybody that knew my mom and they'll say the same thing. God, your mom's a saint. Uh, she was very religious uh she never cussed if she said the word damn it was oh my god you know the the the, the sky's falling in because something's really wrong if, if she goes there and this on the other side i had my dad who was just the opposite you know he 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 was it, you couldn't do you couldn't do anything good enough for him and, and it just that's the way it was it, it didn't matter what you did it just wasn't good enough and with my mom it's it's funny we're talking about this right now because I've got all these baseballs from when I, when I played, I had a ton of balls signed. I, I bought a bunch of baseballs and, and whatever. And I was going through them yesterday. It's been probably, God, it's probably been 25 years at least since I've been going through these balls. And I actually found two balls in there that I signed to my mom. Oh, you know, really? for, one of them was like my first big league win or something like that, or big league hit that I signed to mom. There's nothing in there to my dad. And it, it's, it's, I, it's just hard to describe what my mom did. Uh, she was just that person that, uh, she was always there. I remember when I was pitching Legion ball, you know, the only voice I could hear even in my entire career, you know, you don't hear people in the stands. You just don't, you know, you hear a mumbling and whatever. And I always remember hearing my mom saying, come on, Kipper, come on, Kipper. You know, I, I could hear, I could hear her voice, but nobody else's. And, uh, she, she was just a huge, great person, you know, that she never always had a smile. Nobody had a, uh, any type of argument with her, uh, always smiling, just a great influence, you know, and, and positive and, and guided you through life as far as, you know, things to learn. Uh, I mean, I, I, I treat women completely different than most people do because my mom, I mean, she, she, she told me one time, never, ever in your life, disrespect a woman. Just don't do it because you can't ever take it back. Once you do it, you can never take it back. And so uh, 
it, it's just something that's been instilled in me my entire life. I can't do it. I mean, it doesn't matter what happens with that a woman. I, I can't say a bad word to her. I can't do it. It's just in me because my mom. And then unfortunately, my mom passed away when she was 50 in 1991 of, of terrible brain cancer. And uh, it was it was it was it was a tough one. It was a tough one. And uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, it, it's you know, you hear people grieve differently in different ways. I didn't grieve for my mom for 29 years. Uh it was on Christmas Eve and I just decided to write this little paragraph on Facebook about my mom because it was her favorite time of year. And, uh, I, I've, I've been, I've been crying about my mom ever since it's, it's, it's crazy. And I did, I didn't cry when my mom passed away because I was happy for her because, because she was in such pain and, and, uh, she had to be married to my dad for all those years. And I was actually happy for her. So yeah, she was, she was a huge, huge influence in my life. And, and, you know, you, you know, when you go through life and do certain things, uh, you think about the person that influences you once in a while. And my mom, I can't tell you how often, how often I think about my mom and, okay, what should I do in this situation? What should I do? What, she, what would she do right now? And so, yeah, huge influence. Yeah, it's it's amazing because I think our, our moms do more as far as just, you know, being there for that that nurturing part, because, you know, our dads are the you know, they're the ones, you know, at the games that are, like you said, always trying to coach and everything else. It's the moms that I think, you you know, you talk about you pick up on that voice because it's something that that you recognize. And, um, you know, and so, you you know, you, you get caught up and you, you're, you're pitching. Did, was, your, was your mom there for for that? Uh, your, your, your major league call up when you were there, but to see you pitch, was she able to, to be there and, and just kind of yeah. take it all in? This, this is, this is the whole part of my story. It's really strange. Uh, my mom and dad, I believe went to two games at one, one in college and one professional. And it was, it was my dad. Don't get me wrong. My mom probably always wanted to be there. I, I used to call my mom all the time on the phone. And, and talk to her, but no, they, my, they weren't there for any of my games. And it wasn't my mom, it was my dad. I, th I think there was a jealousy factor is what it comes down to after writing this book and, and understanding what really happened. Uh, the only professional game my parents came to was a triple a game. When I was with the reds, we were in Denver and Denver happened to be about three hours away from where I grew up. And so the local newspaper wanted to do a story and so that's the reason my dad went to that game so he could be in the paper and it was i you know looking back i didn't really realize just till till this last year what what was really going on inside our house and uh so yeah one game in one game in college and one game professionally and i well that, that was 19 years of baseball two games you know, as, as, you know, as parents with the kids, it seems like it's, it's perpetual, right? I've got three myself and I don't think I get a break. We're at, you know, eight, nine games in a weekend, you know, you, you deal yeah. with that. So, so mentally as far, how did that affect you just, you know, as, as a player, right? And you talk about your mom passing and was it during the season or was it during the off season when she passed? Uh, it was, it was right after the season ended. Uh, quick little story. Uh, get off the plane in Denver. And, uh, like I said, we live about three hours away. And so my sister-in-law at the time, she picks me up at the airport. We got to take off because my mom's in the hospital. And, uh, my house, I had a house in Nebraska at the time that I built and we're driving by it. And I said, Hey, Carol, I said, Hey, let's pull over real quick. I want to take a shower. And she goes, she says to me, she says, Oh, no, forget. she goes, he goes, we don't have time. And I just, I didn't know what was going on. And so we get to the hospital and I walk in and my mom's laying in the bed and I hadn't, I didn't know what was going on. I, I knew she had cancer, but n nobody in the family had told me during the season how much it had progressed. I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. I just, you know, she's doing chemotherapy. I'm thinking everything's fine. Uh, when I talked to her on the phone, things were good. They, they, they didn't tell me the truth in other words. And so my mom was five, eight and she was, she was not, ever heavy at all, uh, always in good shape. And she probably weighed, I'm going to guess 80 pounds when I saw her. And it was the most God awful sight I ever saw in my life. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't leave that room for three days. I didn't, did not leave that room. And I got I got to spend about two hours with her before, before she, you know, 
went to sleep and she never woke up again. And, and, uh, I, uh, had to make a hard decision the third day. The nurses kept walking in and out, you know, they're changing the bags back there or whatever. I don't know what's going on. I really don't. I'm just sitting there waiting for my mom. And, uh, uh, I asked the nurse, you know, what do you, what do you guys keep putting in those bags? She goes, these, these bags are keeping your mom alive. And I, at that time I said, take them down. I just said, take them down. And it was probably, uh, I don't know, probably two hours later that she passed. And like I said, I, I, I didn't even cry. I was so happy for her. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, you know, one of those things that is just, uh, you got to deal with in your life. And, uh, she, she was just, you know, had that influence on you your whole life through baseball. And, and, you know, you remember that, you know, when you're out on the mound, Hey, Kipper, come on, throw him, throw him, throw him, Kipper, you know, do this, do that. It was, it, you know, you st I still hear that voice in my, in my mind once in a while when I'm out doing something, even working in the yard, Hey, Kipper, you know, yeah. get go Kipper. And it, you know, it was, but I, I didn't ever have that with my dad. It just, it was just cuss words, you know, yeah. you son of a bitch. Da, 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 da. And so, you know, it's just one of those things. So. Yeah, I'm, it, I'm sorry I'm getting a little emotional with my no, mom. No, you're but. good. It's that's that's what it's about. I mean, that's what our parents do for us. You know, they they go above and beyond uh, yeah. uh, for us, right? As, as as kids, because that's you know just a different nurturing type of thing. But you know, for you know, everybody has that. that you know, especially in the situation where your mom was that influence to kind of maybe that was that motivation to help you continue to play after you know you were able to see her those last few moments and then you know play for another what with another what eight nine years of doing that yeah. and then being able to tell this story now of what she did the influence that she had and then but then you look at you and the influence that you have on some guy who's coaching in korea but it started with yeah. with mom right and that's what um so you, you know so you so this book you wrote and that is that the premise of this book of just how these interactions have have changed or or how this has kind of affected you and, and the people around you yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, it, there's a lot that revolves around my mom, a lot that revolves around my dad, the influence that both of them had on my life. I mean, my dad's a prick. I mean, he's still alive to this day and, and we don't talk. There's no reason to talk, but the influence that he had in my life was really positive too, because I learned how not to treat people and how to be. And at a young age, I always knew I just didn't want to be him. I did not want to be him at all. And because you know, like I said, on the flip side, I had my mom over here. It was just the opposite. Uh, to this day, I still don't know how the hell they were together. I, I, I still, to this day, have no clue how it all happened. And uh, it's, it's, the, but the influence that these, these parents have on you inside those closed doors, you know, it, it's because people don't know really what happens next door when the, mm -hmm. the doors are closed. You don't, you don't know what's going on over there. You know, I always thought all these families were perfect around me. And after talking to other, other, you know, friends growing up and whatever, they, they weren't perfect at all, but, but, uh, you know, they at least had a little love in their, in their families where my dad had zero and, you know, my mom just loved, loved, loved. And so without my mom, who knows where I'd be today? I really don't know it, but like you're saying, the influence, uh, it's just all around you, you know, everything you do, uh, growing up your influence to this day because of it. And that's one of the biggest things I've learned writing this book is I am who I am today because of who I was and who I grew up with, with my parents back when I was a kid. It, and that, that's who we all really are. And uh, it's, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow once in a while, but at the same time, I'm, I'm glad I'm actually glad it happened too, because like I said, if my dad wasn't such a prick, I might've been that prick because it would have been easy for me, you know, going through life, you know, how some kids do today, you know, everything's handed to them, whatever. And I had nothing handed to me as a kid. I, I started, I had started working when I was nine years old, if I needed another t-shirt or another pair of pants, because my dad was not going to give me anything. And I mean, as I scoop of snow in the middle of the night, you know, going door to door, ringing doorbells, Hey, can I scoop your snow for two or $3? You know, I'd bring, you know, I'd had, I had actually had a business uh, mowing lawns in, in the summer when I was really young kid, you know, I'd push my mower down, I'd mow people's lawns and that's, you know, it, it, I can call my dad all the names I want to call him, but at the same time I had to do these things I'm, and I'm glad that I had to do them to this day now, because who knows what I would have done 
otherwise, you know, we're sitting here talking about these kids have everything and what they, you know, they don't listen and all this stuff. And I, I, I had to just go out on my own and do things my way. And so, yeah, uh, you're, you're influenced big time with your parents. Yeah. And how you grow up. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's what this, maybe the premise of the book is, is trying to, you know, I, we've talked with, with numerous guys on here about the influence that we have. If we've changed one person's life, right, you've done your job. And, you know, who's to say that this book um, doesn't change multiple people, right, of, of what, they, what you've been through? Because a lot of people are afraid to talk about anything, right? They don't want it to be, they want to hide it. Right. And that's the that, biggest that's, thing. That's the whole premise of this book is, is I'm not hiding it. I'm letting it all out. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing it all out there for, for anybody to read and, and to understand, you know, the name of the book's figure it out because my entire life I've had to figure it out. And, uh, and so that's basically the whole premise is, you know, just because you have that same dad or that same parent, that same growing up uh, influence growing up, doesn't mean that you can't, better yourself and do things on your own and, and turn out to be somebody instead of, you know, hiding in a, in a corner and, you know, just saying, well, I, I can't do this because of this. Well, no, it's, you're, you can't do it because you don't want to do it. And, you know, like I said, I walked on the university of Nebraska, which one of the dumbest things I ever did in my life. If you look back at it, but, uh, I did it because I wanted to keep playing. I wanted to find out how good I could, how good I was. And so, you know, you do things in life and you fail in life, but, but if you don't try, you're never going to fail. And so I failed at so many things. It's crazy. You know, I mean, (laughs) and so, I mean, now when I fail, I laugh at myself, you know, because, because it's just one of those things where, you know, you're going to get better because you just failed again. Because now you figure it out. Oh, well, I, I now know how to do this. I mean, I'm that guy that just fixes everything around the house. Uh, you know, I, I, I love failing because when I fail, I now I know I'm going to succeed right after that. So it, it's just, it's, yeah, it's it, life's funny. Yes. That way it is. So to go, so people can go find, find the book and they can find you on, on social media. I know we're, we're that older generation of learning the social media. Where can they go to find the book and, you know, reach out to you questions that I'm sure there's people that have questions that want to reach out to you and ask, is there any way they can follow you or find you? Yeah, it's right now. The book isn't finished yet. Believe it or not, we're, we're still writing it because, because, uh, my ghostwriter, she's, uh, she's doing a lot of editing and she wants to make sure everything's just right for this whole thing. And uh, kipgross.com is where you can go. Uh, and, you know, you can do pre-orders right now, but it's it's probably going to be ready in probably just over a couple months is where it's going to be ready to go. Uh, it, it's been a long, drawn-out process because once you start talking about your life and your childhood and what goes on in your life, it's amazing. I mean, I'm 58 years old, and it's amazing what you start remembering as a kid and over the years, what actually goes on in your life. And so, you know, I, we've gone backwards so many times, you know, cause when you, when you write a book, you, you just don't start when you're a little kid and go up over the year, over the year, over the year, you know, you remember this and then that takes you back to another couple of years and then, you know, just back and forth, back and forth. And so it's been a long drawn out process as far as putting everything together and what she is doing right now is, is it's gotta be crazy because I, I, First of all, I, I've never read a book in my life. And then here I am writing a book and sh- I can't write, period. You know, I ever like I told you, every time I write on Facebook or something, it doesn't come out right. And so she's got to put all this together. And so she just wants to make sure it's done properly because she thinks it's it's going to be quite the story. So kipgross.com. Sounds like it. You're, you know, you figure it out. It sounds like it's, it's a healing book for you and maybe those who, who pick it up and read it. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You know, when when this when it, when it gets out, and um, you know, following you, like I said, we're you know, we comment on Facebook on different stuff and this and that. But you know, that's just a part of it. You know, helping everybody out, and hopefully, this book does at some point. You know, that, that, that's the whole point. We yeah. just see if I can help anybody out because, I, like you said, it, it's been a big, big healing process for me. It has this whole this whole process, and I didn't realize that going into it at all how much of a healing process it really is for myself. And so if anybody can read this book and it can help them in any way, uh, I, I, that, that's what I'm hoping for more than anything, because I, I just, I don't want anybody to have to go through what I went through as a kid. <laughs> Cause I mean, it, it wasn't fun. 
yeah. you know, nobody, nobody really knew it around me because I was such a good actor with everything. But, uh, but that's what I'm saying. When the doors are closed in your house, people on the outside don't know what's going on in there. And so, uh, that, that's a lot of the things that's in this book to, to let people understand, Hey, you're, you're not, you're not alone in this. You're not, you know, that's a, let's start talking about it a little bit so you can understand what, what life is really supposed to be like. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to it, Kip. And I, and I appreciate you taking the time to come in and, and tell the story. And, you know, once it's out, we'll be able to, you know, push it around. And, and, uh, like I said, I'm looking yeah. forward to reading it. So, um, like I said, reach out and find, follow Kip and he said, kipgross.com and, and, uh, and see what this, uh, this whole book's about and everything else. So, but I appreciate you jumping on here today, Kip and, uh, and telling your story. Thank you for having me. It's yeah. been fun. Absolutely. And uh, like I said, we'll see how this book goes uh, once it gets out. So, man, I appreciate it, and uh, we'll be in touch. Awesome. awesome. All right. Thanks, Kip. I appreciate it. Have a great day, okay? Yep, you too. All right. Thanks.